Half a day. Welcome to the Guam Congress building. The Committee on Health, Land, Justice and Culture is now called to order. Today's Tuesday, April 18th, 2023. It's now 11.20 a.m. In compliance with the open government law, notices for this oversight hearing were published in the Guam Daily Post and the Government of Guam Public Notice Portal on Tuesday, April 11th and Friday, April 14th, 2023. This hearing is being live streamed on the Guam Legislature's YouTube channel. Notice was also sent by email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on the 11th and 14th. Uh, general rules of conduct. I will um, introduce the agenda today and a summary of the issue. We will hear testimony from the Department of Public Health and Social Services. We will have questions and comments from the panel. Other individuals testifying uh, will, are also welcome, but individuals, all individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair and please begin by stating your name for the record. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues, beginning with my Vice Chair, Senator Joanne Brown, Senator Tello Taitikui, and Senator Jesse Lujan. Thank you, Senators, for being here this morning. It's my understanding we have to, with us today the Acting Director, Ms. Charlene St. Nicholas of the Department of Public Health and Social Services, Ms. Patricia Moffness, who's the Acting Chief for the Division of Children's Wellness, Ms. Crystal Gooden, Gooden, Social Services Supervisor 2, and Ms. Sarah Senior, Social Worker 3. All right, so this oversight hearing is for the Department of Public Health and Social Services on improvements to foster parent eligibility and background check requirements and to receive updates on the current number of foster care providers and foster care licenses pending. On March 13th of this year, the community was outraged to learn of a case of a child in the foster care system that was allegedly sexually assaulted by a foster parent. According to media reports, the foster parent had been charged twice before on allegations of molest molestation of children known to him, uh, one five months prior to the current case and in 2018. The community reacted with great concern for how a person with past charges of criminal sexual conduct against minors could be licensed as a foster parent. On, April 20, on March 24, um, Senators Joanne Brown and Tello Taitikui requested the committee um, have a, a public hearing to look into the practices and procedures of those responsible for the safe operation of Guam's foster care system in the wake of these allegations. As the chairperson of the Committee on Health, I immediately requested the Department of Health and Social Services to provide the committee with the following information. One, the steps taken to investigate and address the incident. Number two, to answer how a person with an active charge of criminal sexual conduct became eligible to be a foster parent. Three, to verify if police and court clearances are required as part of the vetting process to be a foster parent and four, to provide a copy of the rules and regulations and standard operating procedures for the eligibility and vetting of foster care parents. Attorney Peter Santos informed the media subsequent to my request that the perpetrators, uh, the alleged perpetrator's defense attorney, sorry, he was the alleged perpetrator's defense attorney at the time that the alleged victim in a previous case had recanted their allegations and thus explained that the case against the individual was dismissed and expunged. Consequently, Child Protective Services was not alerted during the foster parent application background check of these past complaints as expunged cases do not appear on the required police and court clearances or the Child Abuse and Neglect Registry. On March 28th, I met with the Department of Public Health and Social Services and the Bureau uh, leadership to receive updates on the steps being taken to address uh, gaps in background information. In light of this case, Public Health is taking steps to expand the vetting process beyond current required criminal history background checks and informed that they are also working with the Guam Police Department to see how to obtain a history of arrest record as part of the expanded process. The Attorney General's Office was also assisting with expanding background checks, preparing a legal document for applicants attesting to criminal history clearances and with access to FBI National Crime Information Center system. A few of the challenges um, 
is that access was provided to governmental social services agencies with child protection responsibilities only for investigating or responding to reports of child abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Pursuant to Section 151 of the Adam Walsh Act and did not meet the need for access to the system on a 24-7 basis, which is necessary for emergency placements. So I also ask uh, the Department of Public Health and Social Services to expound on these issues during their testimony today and what steps, uh, additional steps are being taken. And I want to commend them for their quick action on this. Uh, I know when we met, they had already met with very many of our law enforcement agencies and the judiciary to, to come to um, increased um, background checks or information for background checks. All right, so we'll now hear from uh, the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Ms. Charlene Sinicholas, Acting Director, you are recognized. Hi, yes, thank you, uh, Speaker. So we do have some um, just opening information to share, and then we will go through the information that was requested and submitted on April 17th. Uh, so uh, for now, uh, today, our team at Public Health and Social Services, Division of Children's Wellness, uh, Bureau of Social Services, administration uh, with, with Child Protective Services is here to share the process that we have used to vet placements of our children in foster homes. The process used and one we, we, we continue to use has been the system we relied on to clear applicants of any convictions that would make the applicant an inappropriate placement as a foster home. The system has been relied on for years and not until recently has shown more needs to be done to conduct background checks of applicants. For years, we have relied on our law and legal systems database to provide us information to make decisions to protect and safeguard our children when processing applicants to be a foster home placement, relative, relative placement, or in child care centers. The systems used did not, did not and do not provide cases of alleged child abuse. The data systems we use provide convictions. Today we are interested in reviewing information of both allegations and convictions of our applicants who apply to be a foster parent. With the recent situation, we have conferred with the Office of the Attorney General, the Guam Police Department, and the District Court of Guam to discuss what other database system can we access and use to ensure applicants' history of any crimes committed or alleged is information we have access to as we determine the proper placement for our vulnerable children. This situation is an opportunity for us to look at our current mandate, the requirements we put forth, and what more can we do all together to fill this hole in the vetting process. For us to consider as we further review the current mandate is whether a provisional license is a license we should delete and require full application be completed before placement is authorized. As a practice, provisional licenses are no longer authorized as we need to ensure a full and complete packet is completed. Yes, we are faced with weekly if not daily challenges to place our children in a safe home. What we need to own as a community is, it is a process that requires time. Time we believe we don't have, yet time we have to make to ensure the placement is sound, safe, and secured. The team here today, which again, it consists of our social services supervisor too, our uh, foster care licensing social worker, and our acting uh, Bureau of Social Services Administrator, also the acting chief for the Division of Children's Wellness, uh, share the application process to be a foster parent. We assure you, as we are here to state for the record, the background check process was not compromised and continues to be complied with when vetting applicants to be a foster parent. In fact, additional background checks are now required. The revelation of someone with allegations through social media reminds us of the power of social media and how proper use of this medium can aid us in the work we do to protect our children. And we have also, again, I, uh, submitted uh, responses to the questions you had asked of our department. 
Thank you, uh, Acting Director. Hi, good morning. Could we go ahead and cue the slide? All right, please state your name for the record, though. Hi, I'm Patricia Moffness. I'm the Acting Chief for the Division of Children's Wellness, and also I'm running the day-to-day -day operations of BOSA since January. Thank you so much. All right, we've got a, a PowerPoint. Thank you. Please yes. proceed. Thank you very much. So this is for the Division of Children's Wellness, the Bureau of Social Services Administration, also known as BOSA. And we're going, I'm going to be discussing the foster parent eligibility and background checks. Next slide. Um, currently, we follow Public Law 23-143, which is an act to establish rules and regulations of the Department of Public Health and Social Services, pursuant to subsection 2407 of Chapter 2, titled Foster Homes and Certification and Licensing of Persons Interested in Foster Parenting Care. The purpose of this is to formulate standards for family foster homes and to provide guidelines for certification, issuance, and operation of licensing to persons interested in foster, fostering parenting care. Next slide. So the qualification of applicants based on this public law is that married couples can apply or domestic partners, either joint or alone, a single person age 18 or older, single parent age 18 or older, residents of the territory of Guam, unless they qualify as active military or their dependents, United States citizens or resident aliens. Next slide. The background checks based on public law, sorry. The background checks requirement um, for the current law is uh, Guam police clearance. And it was also indicated that a National Crime Information Center clearance was was, was indicated in the law. And also a Navy Criminal Investigative Services or Office of Special Investigation Clearance is needed for either active duty mili military applicants or their dependents. But as asterisk below, um, it, the NCIC is unobtainable as per Section 151 of the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act of 2006. Um, it is only to be used to be used only in investigating or responding to reports of child abuse, neglect, or exploitation, not specifically for placement of children. So we couldn't use it for it. And that was in October of 2021 when we were informed. Next slide. So like I said, on October 2021, the NCIC was unavailable to BOSA to utilize for placement background checks. So the NCIC was replaced with the court clearance. From, I wanted to point out that from November 1st, 2021 to, pre, to yesterday, there have been 1,242 placements. And of, and of those placements that have been authorized, this is the one case that has brought, a, um, that, is called, that is called a review for, um, to review this licensing process. Next slide. We, like stated earlier, we are collaborating with the Attorney General. Um, we met with him on March 22nd of this year, and um, they're providing us AG clearances for licensed foster families and relative placements. Um, they provide us a disposition that will reflect if there is a case with the General Crimes Division. So on April 4th, I, we sent a whole listing of all licensed um, foster families and all the adults in the household that live within these households um, for clearances and all households were cleared. So we have um, increased the number of background checks to date in response to this and um, it includes the Guam Police Clearance, the Superior Court of Guam Clearance, a virtual computerized criminal history which will reflect arrest, that's called the VCCH, um, the Attorney General clearance, um, indicating if there is a crime with the General Crimes Division, and this indicates if there are charges and convictions. We also do a child abuse and neglect. I'm sorry, next slide, please. It's not showing. There. It also, we also do a child abuse and neglect registry that is done in-house at our Bureau. If active duty or dependent, we do a we are requesting a Navy Criminal Investigative Service or Office of Special Investigation Clearance. 
We've also added the local sex offender registry check and a national sex offender, offender registry check, as well as a general internet search. Um, so just to indicate on the Guam police and the Superior Court of Guam clearance, it only provides the convictions and not if there was an arrest or, or charges. Okay, could you just pause there, please? Where do you get the VCCH? We have um, partnered up with Department of Youth Affairs. Okay, DYA, great. Yes, DYA. Okay, and then the sex offender registry and the national sex offender registry, what do those give you? Convictions Just only, convictions right? convictions only again. All right, okay, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Other requirements for licensing include the consent for disclosure so we can do all the background checks, uh, marriage license if applicable. There is a medical history um, form that families fill out. All, family mem all members of the household have to do a TB clearance. There is a physical examination, um, like a certification that the, from the doctor. Employment verification for the applicants. Copy of two recent check stubs. A financial report is required that in indicates the monthly income and expenditures an autobiography um, of the applicants, which discusses their background, their relationships, their child rearing experience, and even religion and morals. We also conduct a social evaluation, which is done by the Home Evaluation and Placement Section social worker. And this discusses motivation for being a foster parent, a relationship with the extended family members, um, if there's any family support, parenting, um, and how they discipline. Or another requirement is three character references from family, friends, or coworkers, and a home assessment is conducted to ensure the home is safe for the child. So this is conducted by either the social worker at HEPS or CPS social workers. Next slide, please. Future plans to expand our background checks. As er discussed earlier, we have reached out to Chief Ig Stephen Ignacio of the Guam Police Department. Um, we are requesting a police clearance to include charges in criminal history. Um, and we are to work with the Criminal Investigation Division and the Domestic Abuse Response Team on any active cases. And we are asking access to the Law Enforcement Records Management System. With the Superior Court of Guam, I've reached out and discussed with the court administrator, Danielle Rossetti, about the possibility of obtaining court clearances with active cases. We discussed possibly if it's for child placement or child care facility, that it can be indicated in the form instead of employment. So it's outside of the employment realm. And then also, we are work public health and the court will be working together um, on an MOU for the National Crime Information Center fingerprint background checks. So that's something that is done at the court. And what would that show you? All um, national and local um, records, arrest or anything. So that's a requirement for our, um, as a standard for foster licensing, is even for child care facilities for background checks. But you don't use it now? No, we don't. We okay. don't. Thank you. Next slide, please. Moving forward, um, public health will continue the review of our Guam administrative rules and regulations to evaluate it and to evaluate also our SOPs and our policies. Um, we want to look at what the qualifications are today of applicants and update them for improvement. We are going to meet with our stakeholders to see if other updates need to be done. And that's like including GPD, the Superior Court of Guam, DYA, Harvest House, licensed foster families, um, even with Guam Behavioral Health. We are researching other state statutes that require background checks that have convictions and pending criminal charges for prospective foster adoptive relative placements. And um, once we do that, um, we do our review, we will provide you speaker with um, our findings and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, is there a other testimony from public health? Okay. No. 
All right. Thank you. So I'm going to um, open it up for the panel for questionings, and I want to clarify. Thank you, Public Health, for your work with these other entities to expand uh, access, access to additional information. So you had always done, never failed, doing the background checks that you, were, you had access to. That is to convictions, and of course, anyone on, on um, uh, well, through, through police clearances and court clearances, you were getting convictions. But if their records had been expunged, you were not getting access to that. And if there was no pending cases, you were not getting access to that. So these additional measures that you've taken are going to give you access to arrest records. So even if they've been resolved or, or removed, right? You, you would have access to that. You would have access to active cases. And um, through the Attorney General's office and through the courts. Is this, um, uh, it says discussion with the courts. Are you pretty certain this is going to occur? In my discussion with Ms. Rosetti, she was gonna talk with her team and I did express what we do need. And um, if, if it's not allowable within you know, regulations, and I think that's when we would reach out to the legislature for help to, to allow that to happen, to right. give us that access. Okay, thanks. Please uh, set a short time frame for that and get back to us. And the LERMS is the Access to Law Enforcement Records Management System. What will that show you? Superior Court of Guam. For the LERMS, my understanding, it will show all arrests, any convictions, any, his any criminal history. Okay, great. Um, all right. So, again, in the case that was in the news, that record had been expunged, so it was not provided on the police or the court clearance that you had received from the courts. And since 2021, you no longer had access to that federal database, which was the, NCIC, National Crime Information Center. This is now only accessible to you if there is an active investigation by that CPS. Okay, thank you. All right, um, all right, so Senator, uh, Vice Chair Joanne Brown, any questions or comments for the panel? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I just wanted to ask, I see that uh, Acting Director Camacho is here. Or, I'm sorry, it's San Nicholas, I have that correct? Where is your director? Director is unavailable at this time. Okay, unavailable off-island, unavailable? Uh, uh, unavailable, he's uh, on medical. Okay. You have two deputies, neither one yeah, of them are well, available well, either. Uh, the other, the other deputy is also on medical as well. Both your deputies are on medical? Uh, one that I am aware of, correct. Yeah, okay. Well, I bring it up because, I mean, it's, it, you're, you're kind of put in an interesting position as an acting because you're really not ultimately the party responsible that we want to talk to. But um, I just want to state that for the record. It is concerning. I understand. I myself am under the weather, but I definitely felt this was important enough to be here. Uh, I certainly hope your director is feeling better, but I think we need to recognize that this is a pretty serious issue. I don't think we're gonna wrap this up in a nice little bow today and go home and feel a sense of comfort. I mean, this to me shows a failure in the processes that we had in place to protect a child, a child, an innocent child. Many of you work every day with children in our community that because of unfortunate circumstances within their own home, uh, you know, come into our care, um, and certainly in no way ever is the expectation that this child is going to be put in a position of harm, to be hurt, to be abused, and the worst thing you think of for a child is to be sexually abused, especially from an individual that they are assuming is in a position of authority and someone that they should trust to take care of them. Um, I see that you outline what your future plans are to expand in your discussions with the Attorney General. But in this particular case, um, even though this, and, and that's where we need as legislators to look at policy, how do we further strengthen this and put requirements in place so this, this sort of thing doesn't happen again? 
because you have these individuals that are child sexual predators that can be the most articulate, the most smooth, the most nicest people that you would know and you'd never imagine that they would abuse children. You know, they're not the person that's sloppy and their last beer was at 6.30 in the morning. You know, you kind of have that image of what and who they are. And we have to take every possible step in place to ensure that these children that are already coming from a turbulent family situation, whatever the case may be, that are put in our care, uh, that we hope that they are safe. Because this is a case that's been reported. We don't know if there are other cases of children in our foster care system on Guam that have been abused. We don't know that. Maybe in time, maybe those issues may come to light. Maybe people who have been abused may speak up. We don't know that. And I think we just need to be very, very concerned about it and what steps we need to take and what background checks we need to look at. I mean, you've listed what, you, what you've had accessible, what you're looking in the future to put in place. As part of the application process to be a foster parent, um, do you guys do interviews with anyone that may be a friend or family, an associate of an individual to determine their credibility? Do they have any issues of concern that may be questionable? I mean, because we only get people when they're convicted, right? But there are many people that, you know, slip and slide out of the system and never get convicted and you just never catch them. Doesn't mean they haven't committed these type of crimes. So what, to, what degree do we actually investigate an individual or families? And I wanna stay from the very beginning. We're not questioning at all the foster families and the majority, vast majority of our foster families are doing a wonderful job. Those that have stepped up and have made that sacrifice in our community to take in these children. And I understand from the pandemic, you guys have relayed the numbers just really increase substantially. So this is not about those foster families because we have a lot of good people out there and God bless their souls for all that they're doing. But with regards to this case in particular, what background checks or credibility checks were done by public health with this individual? Because I understand this may have not involved just one child assigned to this individual that the sibling brother may have also been in this household. Senator Brown, with all respect, and I understand the questioning, because it's an active case that's going through um, the judici you know, judicial, judicial system, we can't comment specifically on that case. In relation to other cases, we do have families that come in. We do talk with them about the foster care process. We, we do a social evaluation with them. We interview them to know about their background and, you know, what's the motivation of wanting to be a foster parent? We have, we, we may have a lot of documents to do, but we also have, like, Sarah here, who's our social worker who is in charge of the HEP section, that she does. She meets with these families and talks to them. Um, there's also some um, other, outside of BOSA, a lot of these foster families um, seek information and guidance from even like Harvest House. So it's like a community of foster families um, that talk. So, but specifically to the case, I'm sorry, I can't comment on it. I have to it. tell you, you know, I understand that the, you know, the Guam police and the attorney general are going to do their investigation, but this is a legislative inquiry. Um, you know, we're going to hear that, well, we can't talk about that particular case, and that's the particular case that has brought us here today. I don't want to get too generic about it, you know, too vanilla because this is very concerning. I mean, if this was any one of our children, if it was my child, I'd be banging your door down and having attorneys left and right and up and down. This, of all the things the government has to do, aside from educating our children in a classroom, is probably one of the most important things we need to do and do well. We don't get to mess up on stuff like this. We just don't get that privilege. Because this, for me, was very disconcerting. I think of anyone who's a parent, those of you that are mothers out there, grandparents, if you think this could have happened to your child, your grandchild, you'd be up in arms. So, you know, even your director, Madam Speaker, I, I think the director should be subpoenaed when he's well enough to be here, because this is serious. This is not something we just, let's just smooth it over, you know, let's smooth the icing on the cake and we're all good. This is something we should be totally upset about, because it's not acceptable that this could slip through, that a guy that had a charge against him four months earlier could have been handed an innocent child to abuse. 
And then how did we even find out this child was abused? And then has this child even gotten counseling? And how has this child with their parents, their parents, if this child had parents, how were they counseled? How were they allowed to interface with this child to comfort this child, to give this child some sense of security? Those are all the questions I have. I think a lot of people have those questions. I don't think that's anything we should, you know, smooth over and, oh, we got these new processes, so hopefully this is going to resolve it. So back to my question earlier with regards to investigating someone who's applying to be a foster parent, because particularly in this particular case, to my understanding, this was a male individual, a single male individual. And I'm not talking about, you know, somebody that got off the plane from, a, you know, the mainland and came to Guam and we didn't know his history back there or, you know, he frequents Thailand or whatever the case may be. We had someone in our own community who lived here and this slipped through us. That he was in the court system four months earlier. Because we need to decide maybe some of this stuff, like you're talking about with regards to the federal system here with the Adam Walsh, I, I don't know why they changed the process that you can only access this if someone is being investigated because that to me is after the fact. We want to investigate these people before the fact to make sure that they're, they're not someone, they're not a child predator that is just waiting to deliver an innocent child into their hands for them to sexually abuse. That poor child, what recourse do they have? What recourse do they have? None. And I'd like to know what your processes or procedures, because I don't know, is this the one case in the entire history of public health that a child's been sexually abused by a foster parent? Has this child received counseling? Has the family received counseling? What access does that child have to his biological parents? Senator, um, I just want to add that Hello, Senator Brown. My name is Crystal Gooden. I'm the Social Service Supervisor, too, for the Bureau. Um, generally, okay, speaking, any concern regarding any children um, under the care of CPS that if there is an incident that occurs with a child, the parents are informed about, that, about the situation for the child. And children are immediately linked to services, whether it's counseling, depending on what the needs are, children are immediately provided the service. If they're already engaged in services and something occurred and there was a concern, we are already reaching out to that service provider regarding the concerns and immediately being seen by that provider. Um, as far as in general with any of our children under CPS. That is the, the process that we do. Um, other protective factors that we've done is ensuring that CPS workers are going out to the home. If a homemaker is assigned to the case, then of course that homemaker is also having contact with those children. We do schedule visitations with parents if parents are available and have constant contact with us. It's not that we do not provide any kind of contact with parents and children. Um, we try our best to make sure that, that those contacts are made frequently. And we don't have Child Protective Service telling children what to say or not to say to their parents? C CPS workers do not, um, children have the ability to express their concerns, uh, especially during visitations. Um, if there is a concern that is brought up, many CPS workers should already be addressing any of those concerns immediately um, to ensure that any questions 
that are being asked, especially re in regards to parents, are being addressed immediately. And do you know that as an absolute fact that all your caseworkers are never telling these children not to talk to their parents about anything regarding any interaction that they might have had with CPS? I'm so sorry, Senator. Can you reframe that question? No, I, I'm not going to reframe it. I don't have a problem speaking the English language. Can you guarantee that that's not the case with the, all of your, your, your caseworkers, that they never tell children not to tell their parents anything? Uh, okay, so. CPS workers should not be uh, But you don't know. Allowed. You don't know factually if that's the case, though, do you? You don't, you don't have ch child case workers telling children or telling parents to tell their child to behave with their foster parent or to listen to their foster parent, do you? That doesn't happen. Maybe the child needs to behave because they're not behaving with their foster parent. Maybe they're acting up. Senator, I cannot speak on behalf of any of the other CPS social workers as far as like their interactions with um, the parents or with the clients individually. I'm just bringing this up because I think it's something you guys need to look into and be aware of. I mean, I'd like to think that every case worker is caring, understanding, and wanting to ensure the safety of these children. But in this particular case, that you say you can't talk about because it's under investigation. If a child that's being abused is being told in any way they can't speak freely, and maybe the parent, biological parent, might have issues. I'm assuming there are issues because, you know, they're, they're in that situation. They might be drugs, it might be alcohol, who knows? Whatever the circumstance is that takes an innocent child because of our issues and puts them in this situation that if there's anything that would impact that communication of that child to freely talk to their parent, because if they can't trust their caseworker or the government or the system that put them in a situation of where they are being abused, who do they trust? Who do they talk to? Maybe my mom and dad scream and yell at me and whatever, but, you know, they're not sexually abusing me, where this foster parent is sexually abusing me. And maybe at some point we'll be able to talk about the specifics of this particular case because it, it's very concerning. There's something wrong in the system here that for this to happen and then for a child in any way to be constrained from informing someone that they trust that they are being abused. Especially if, if, if uh, you have a situation of a caseworker that may be telling a parent to tell, uh, tell their child to listen to the foster parent. And the child's rebelling against the foster parent. I'm sorry, I have no other way of expressing this other than anger because I am very angry. Because these are helpless children that we could not protect. And if our system is set up not to protect them, then Houston, we have a problem. And we can't use any excuse at all. We have so many children, we have this, we don't have this, wasn't that wasn't available. We may need to look as legislators of how do we mandate these requirements so that every step is taken. And granted, I understand there might be circumstances of an individual that has not been convicted. Because some of these people, like I said, sometimes you're shocked. You get the beautiful, you know, star in Hollywood who everyone admires, and you end up, oh my God, they're, they're a child sexual predator. But for every step we need to take, we just can't sugarcoat this and smooth it over and oh well, we'll wait for that investigation to finish. Because I am going to be following this case with the outcome of this particular case and I'm gonna ask our speaker, when it does come out, we need to find out. Because if, if we are in any way contributing to this problem, then we need to do something about it. Because this just can't be acceptable. This is absolutely not acceptable, especially in these cases of these child predators that for all I see in, in, the, in the research cannot be fixed. 
They can't be counseled. They can't be, you know, you can't change whatever it is that makes them who and what they are. And I might be looking at stronger legislation against these child predators. Because putting them back out on the street to go back and abuse more children, to me, is not the solution. And even having these registries is not enough to protect them. I still think of that child, that little girl that went to the bus stop to go to school a few years ago. We remember that case in Tamuning. Went to the bus stop to go to school, and this guy picked her up and sexually abused her. And he just got out of prison. You met with the Attorney General and you relayed that these are procedures now that you're putting in place. Can you outline again what additional review are you looking at putting in place with the Attorney General's office? If you can, please. Our um, meeting with the Attorney General was to, um, he was trying to help us with getting a background check, which was the AG clearance. Um, that he offered up to us. There was a brief conversation about if he could try to give us the NCIC background check, but again, because of the limitations based on the audit that came out that says we cannot use it for placement, it was identified, we cannot use that again. So um, he is assisting us also with um, putting a form together that were a, a an individual applying can attest that they've ever been, had a history of being arrested or accused or convicted of either drug-related or criminal sexual conduct or any kind of abuse or domestic violence. Um, about the legalities of that form, we're asking his assistance with that so that we can ask it earlier, you know, at the point of application so that they, these individuals inform, you know, inform us early, we catch it early, um, and then, of course, we continue with all the background checks again. Well, and I think this is something, as we look at it from policy, that we probably need to expand for anyone, probably not just with children, but elderly. I know also for public health. I mean, it's very concerning in our small island that we even have so many cases uh, of elderly abuse in our community. I think we would really be disgusted if we really knew the degree of elderly abuse that we have so that we can ensure we have background checks that are more thorough, um, not just what they've been convicted on, but some of these other cases for these vulnerable people in our community that perhaps we can look at mandating further um, their history so that we can ensure that these individuals that are working with our children, working with our elderly, working with our disabled, have a more thorough review uh, before we put them in a position of working with our children. Uh, with that, Madam Speaker, I'll allow our other colleagues that are here today to have any questions or comments. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Brown. Senator Taitsky, we are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, I'd like to also thank you for holding this oversight hearing, um, a letter that uh, Senator Brown and I wrote. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I think in the years I've been in the legislature, you're the only one that's really complied to when it, a request for an oversight. And something is important, I know you feel passionately about it. I think all of us do. I hope you, you do realize that. I mean, you can't imagine how much, you know, we're holding our tears back trying to ask these questions and find out what went wrong. Um, but I greatly appreciate your presence here and, and answering it to your best of your ability. But, you know, really, I think the, like, Senator Brown mentioned, I think that uh, your bosses should be here answering these questions. So please know that uh, um, this is not a reflection on, on you at all, but I, I am just as upset and hurt about what's happening because foster parenting adoption has been along uh, the kind of work that I've been looking at, you know, introducing legislation to provide those protections to put in place and when something like this comes through, it, it just shows why we tried so hard to make sure that we don't put the cart before the, the horse and that we put these things in place. Acting Director, when you were reading your testimony earlier, there was a comment that you made, um, and I was trying to get a copy of your testimony, uh, what you were reading, and I believe it was from the director that we did not, I think, 
if I'm not mistaken, we did not fail the process. Is that the comment that he made in that testimony toward the end? And can I get a copy of that, what you read? Oh, go ahead and turn it, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'll provide you or this body with a, with a copy of the can you the Can you yeah. just tell me that one part that I was, you know, mentioning where he said we did not fail the process? I, I don't think it was the word fail uh, that was used. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. It's, I, I'm going to read the excerpt. Yes, we are faced with weekly, if not daily, challenges to place our children in a safe home. What we need to own as a community is... It is a process that requires time, time we believe we don't have, we don't have, yet time we have to make to ensure the placement is sound, safe, and secure. So that wasn't the, the section, so maybe um, there was a part there that basically said that you, you followed everything, and it, it's obvious that um, there is definitely an issue with what process you have in place right now. Um, what I, what I was hoping for, Madam Chair, is to also have the Attorney General in front of us today to discuss uh, what, what listing that you gave the Attorney General to look over, because here it says all households were cleared after you provided these to the, um, to the Attorney General. Can you tell me how many of them, it said on April 4th, right? A listing of currently licensed foster families. First, how many foster families were there that you provided the, uh, the Attorney General to review? Senator, there was a total of 105 names, but that is a mixture of the 85 licensed foster families we currently have. So all background checks are required of all adults in the household. Okay, and that was given to the Attorney General, you said on April 4th? Yes. And then he has cleared all of them, it says. Yes, yes. They were all cleared. I, I'd really like to hear from the Attorney General, you know, his comments. I didn't see any testimony or anything that he, he brought forward. But yet he was really quick when he was, you know, quoted in the paper um, about this particular incident. What really gets me is that you talk about how you're hindered on certain information because of the legality or the courts or certain areas, but you know how simple it was for me to go on this internet and type in the person's name? I, I got things back since 2018, where this gentleman in 2018 was charged with assault, criminal sexual conduct, into just Googling him. It was as simple as that to put up that red flag. Now, I do understand that one of the most important things that I think public health needs to do is regardless, you're doing your background checks. It's as simple as going on Google. We all know that if your sons or daughter is dating somebody, what's the first thing you do? You go to Facebook, you know, or you go online to check out, you know, okay, who is this person? Who's the mom? Who's the dad? Go that extra mile for our children, the most vulnerable, those who don't even have a fighting chance. They deserve that. You know, just Google. So in the meantime, as we're trying to figure this out and cover up those, those holes that our children are falling through, please go online, Google the name of the individual. Maybe that will help you. And if you see a red flag, Regardless if there's no report, you know, that's given to you because it's expunged, this is one way to do it. Thank you, Senator. So we have implemented that as a practice now. Oh, thank um, you. Unfortunately, it happened after the fact, but we are doing that daily now. Okay. You, you told me after the fact, you've got to promise me you're going to do it moving forward. Okay, yes. because I don't know how many times I've been in a public hearing and they've said, okay, we're doing it now, but you know what? There's never follow through. We so that please. Now in, um, in our, we have sent You're not retiring memo. anytime soon, are you? No, far from it, ma'am. Okay, then. <laughs> then I'm holding it to you and don't move from that agency. <laughs> Got it. And if you do, 
teach them how to do simple, what makes common sense, going online. Yes, ma'am. The Attorney General, again, I, I was wishing was, he was here, but um, you, I noticed here where it says home assessment. Where does it say that you have to go, like a, a surprise visit to that foster home? Do you do that on a regular basis? Do you do it quarterly? Do it, you do it monthly? Uh, can you tell me what the process on that is, please? Hello, Senator. My name is Sarah Senior. Okay, can you talk into the mic? And, and plus, I'm, I'm a little hard of hearing. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, good morning. My name is Sarah Senior, and I'm the licensing social worker under Home, home Evaluation and Placement Services. And so, um, how often we do our visits? That was your question? Yes, how, how often do you go to so the house just to pay one, a one, surprise visit? Right. So, one is scheduled, and then one would be a surprise visit. But that's just... There are three eyes, actually three, I want to say maybe three sets of eyes. One is coming from the initial before placement would be one from the home evaluation and that is for placement. And then the social worker also would do a schedule or a surprise. We all do that to include also in addition to the social worker, but we also have the, um, our homemakers that's also your what? Your homemakers? Our homemakers as well. What is that, Home, your homemaker? These are our paraprofessionals that it says the social workers. Homemakers are indivi individuals that help the social workers yeah. who are not in the household that, where the foster child is living? No, the social workers, homemakers are, para well, actually they're supposed to be paraprofessionals in our bureau that it says the... Uh, um, our, our CPS workers. So we've got a couple of, of sets of eyes that do pop-in visits, mm -hmm. schedule visits as well. What is your first name? I'm sorry. I Sarah. Sarah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, again, how many times throughout the year do you do these surprise visits? Quarterly for, quarterly for the um, home evaluation and placement services. Do you do any of them when the child is at a school? You know, like away from the foster home, right? Because I've seen that happen where the social worker has actually paid a visit to a child at a school. Right. It was something totally different. It had to do with the, um, I think it was a divorce situation scenario, but... Yes. The child is away from home where they're not intimidated. Is any of that done at the schools? Or yes, yes okay. ma'am. So you said on a quarterly basis it's done. So for, for the home evaluation placement, which is my section. Right. So it's done quarterly. And one, one could be just a phone follow-up by phone call. But also when we meet with the family, the whole, just to observe the family dynamics in the foster home. But as far as the CPS worker they also conduct visits with the children at school. I know you're not supposed to bring this up, you know, because of the case, but, you know, this individual, okay, how many uh, assessments of the home did you go to for this particular child that has been, uh, unfortunately, so abused? when the, I, speaking to the social worker, that was assigned to the case. Sorry, I'm sorry, Sarah. At this point, this case is being investigated. We've been asked to not comment, so okay. we do re request your uh, assistance with that. I, I apologize. Okay, so you can't tell me at least how many times. Okay. Well, I guess we're going to get another report, right? And we'll be able to see what happened there and some of my questions will probably be answered there so I will respect that you know um, it, it says here with the national crime information fingerprint background and check uh, MOU public health and court there was there was something here in the military side where I know it wasn't there it was something where you are not able to get, obtain yeah you're not able to obtain as per section 15 this is on on two uh, screen one, two, three, the fourth screen, and it says unattainable 
uh, for the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act of 2006 to be used only investigating or responding to reports of child abuse, neglect, exploit. Can you explain this? Is this only for military, the NCSI, or is that why there's a little asterisk? Um, You're, tr you're talking about the third bullet, ma'am? The yes. Navy Criminal Investigations Investigative yeah. Service, NCIS. So that is, again, that is reserved only for active duty military mm -hmm. and their dependents. Okay, and because of this, do you basically don't allow military as foster children because you can't get a full background check on them? Or you just go ahead and still, because it's saying here it's unattainable, all this information. No. And, and of course, they're not, they don't live on Guam, and you know, you're going outside of the realm of the U.S. for wherever they were. I mean, Okay, I'd like to clarify. So the asterisk is only to the second bullet, which is the National Crime Information Center mm -hmm. um, clearance. So that's the only one we cannot attain, obtain. And because? And that was because uh, it was an FBI, an audit was done by the FBI that determined that it cannot be used as a background check specifically for placement. It is only for active investigations. I see. See, and that's, that's where we fell through right there on what, what happened to this child. You know, I, okay. The other question I have real quick is, um, Okay, we, we talked about even though the court records come in, um, you, you can't take, uh, you don't know if it's an active file or anything. It doesn't tell you. They bring it to you. And you did provide us the, the process. Okay. Well, um, my, uh, Madam Chair, I, I really hope that this is not the end of it, you know, with regarding what we can do more of and what needs to be done and the promise of these ladies to follow through by simple Googling a name and uh, finding a, a way that we don't lose sight of what's so important to us and that's our children and those who unfortunately are left with no, no one to take care of them except you ladies sitting in front of us. They rely on you. And I know you're hurt because of what have happened. I know you are. But let's take that hurt, that pain, that energy, and focus on how can we make this better. Okay? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Taitsugui. Senator Luhan. Thank you, Madam, Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, ladies. You know, this is a real travesty, and I know this is as uh, um, devastating to you as it is to us and the community in general. Um, and it's incumbent upon us to holistically fix the system. Um, and uh, I know that um, you had said here that uh, between November 1st, 2001, or 2021 and April 17, 2023, there have been 1,242 placements. And this is the one case, of course, that has called upon the uh, review of the licensing process. And again, I'm, you know, to all of us, and you folks sitting there as well, that uh, this is one too many, one too many. You know, the unfortunate thing here is I wish we had a system to monitor all kids, be it foster or kids in, in natural homes. Um, and we had a system to, um, to monitor the kids and make sure they're, I mean, it's incumbent upon us, it's our moral obligation. The unfortunate thing is our society, we have, we've, um, we've un, we're in a, a downhill, moral decline and um, I'm sure uh, as well that um, you're looking at all aspects to be able to strengthen uh, the, um, uh, the process that you currently have that this will never happen uh, again but, but let, let, me, let me ask you this as well because uh, I, I know there's a balance and you know as an agency and, and uh, regulators um, you need to balance of course 
the, the higher standard that should be placed in placing kids within foster care and the balance of, um, uh, again, folks accused but not convicted and, and working within the, the confines of, of the law. And not to get into the case in, in, in general, as you asked us not to, but my understanding is in, in this particular case, there was a, there was a um, um, accusation and then a recanting, right? Of that nature, yeah, recanting and an expungement, right? Yeah. Um, should this case again, should this particular case again be recanted and expunged, which I seriously doubt, but should, what happens? Will, will the situation, will, this, will the individual be still eligible to be a foster parent? No, we would not. Okay. So now with the increased background checks, to even include that Google check, mm -hmm. it's gonna come up. And so our social workers and of course our whole team at CPS is to evaluate if this is a safe placement. Mm -hmm. And if it's not in the best interest of this child, we will not mm -hmm. approve it. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, no, and I understand. I mean, uh, again, you're working with the confines of the law, right? Um, what is it, what is that, uh, you know, you're uh, innocent until proven guilty until you're accused, but, but in this, in you know, in situations where kids are minors, and, and as our <clears throat> the vice chair of the committee, Senator Joanne Brown, in regards to kids, can be talked in, talked into things and talked out of things as as well, recantment or whatever. It could be both sides of 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 that. Uh, um, and so, one who is accused, if you do a Google check, right, do a Google check, and someone is applying to be a foster parent, a Google check, and, and says, oh, there's, a, there's, an active, there's an active case. Now, there's no conviction yet. There, maybe there's a charge, but there's an active case going on. What do you do with that, and what happens, what happens when that particular individual, that case again, is dropped, and, and there, there's no active case, and you know, there, there's nothing. It shows that there's nothing. But in your initial, in your initial search, there was, there, there was an accusation. So what will, what will happen then because there's no record, but you've already had in your Google search, your previous Google search, you saw that there was an accusation. But then a year later, there was nothing. So therefore, this individual has been cleared and nothing, you know, not, nothing follows and all that. So what happens then? Can that, I mean, you're, I mean, again, uh, what will you do in that situation? Our priority at CPS and BOSA is to mm -hmm. protect the child period. Sure. So if there is a history and though it may not be they're convicted, it is something that we have to consider that, is it safe for the child? Highly likely not if it's mm -hmm. a repetitive issue, especially like this case. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, we, may, we can. We are allowed to deny any application for foster okay, families. Okay. So you are, you, are, you are allowed to look at things and say, mm, Correct. You're not, nah, nah. It doesn't, doesn't feel right, doesn't look right. I mean, you, you, can, you can look at an application and look at the situation and just say, no, no, you, you know, we can't allow that. Correct. And you know, with the years of experience our social workers have, sure. they, they've created a, that they have the judgment call to do this. Mm -hmm. um, evaluate the situation, go out there, um, look at the home, talk to this person. Um, like I said, we, if we are not comfortable with it and we don't feel like this is a safe placement, we will deny the application. Um, the, the applicant may, you know, ask for a fair hearing with our director, but mm -hmm. really in the end, it's up to the director and, mm -hmm. w and public health can deny any application. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't want to jeopardize even, try, even with the trying to put a, a child there and, and with such a huge risk. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't do that. Now, now when, when, when a child is placed in foster, in foster care, um, 
Um, do you guys check up on the child and do you talk to the child? I mean, how oft, I mean, yeah, how often from the placement do you guys, do you folks check up on the child and, and you know, maybe if there, maybe if their their red flags have gone up, uh, you know, how do you go around it to, 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 to make sure that the child is safe and not being, you know, that child having uh, an adult uh, over them, basically, um, that they're not talked into to, to situations or, or talked out of situations, and, that, and how do you how do you go around that? Uh, and, and how often, from placement, do you um, do you check up on the, the child and, and the family setting or the yeah the the, the foster care um, situation? So, from placement time and however long the child is there, the goal is to see the child as often as possible, to remain in contact, either home visits, um, monthly or bi-weekly. Um, from the HEP section, where Sarah's from, you know, um, as well as for the assigned social workers, as well as the homemakers. These homemakers, I wanted to say they're part, they are, assist the social workers. They physically go into homes, they help families. Um, if there's even like a, a family at risk of coming under, um, what do we call it, that we, instead of exerting on a child and we're trying to assist these families, a homemaker can go in and, and um, assist with, hey, you know, there's an issue about cleanliness to the home or with um, med um, there's no medical coverage or mm -hmm. you need your kids, you need help to get your kids into school. These homemakers go out there and they assist families, but they also visit with the children at home, the, the foster placements. Um, again, also, other than the home visits, a lot of the social workers visit the kids at school. We try to make, um, they try to make themselves available. Um, kids are informed of who their social workers are, contact numbers. Um, if there's any concern, they can reach out. Um, but also, it's the social worker going and seeing the child to talk to them. Um, perhaps the child will disclose something, and that's when we will respond immediately. Mm -hmm. So um, there are many children in our foster system, and but I know that our team at BOSA has been going out of their ways and really trying hard to make sure that these children are checked on. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, if a child is placed in foster care as a result of uh, previous sexual abuse, is there... Um, um, there are different standards again that you you look upon uh, the future or the um, the foster parent to be in regards to that situation or, or their situation. That I mean, is there a um, so, uh, additional Senator, safeguards? I, yeah. I'm asking out of ignorance. <laughs> no, it's it's okay. Um, generally really a lot of our foster parents are given a lot of information in regards to the needs, unique needs of each of the foster child mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the different services that these children are linked to. Mm -hmm. um, if there's specific things as far as, let's say, essay allegations and these, this child is linked to services, they already have a counselor, they're linked with Guam Behavioral Health, um, appointments can be scheduled as often as possible with counselors or with Guam Behavioral Health to address specific behaviors that may be coming up in the home or to help assist the, the foster family to help um, understand the trauma that they're going through and what they can do in the home to help um, I guess support the foster child to thrive in the home. Um, and that's really with the social worker working closely with the foster parent and with the different service providers. There's constant communication to address the needs for each child. Mm -hmm. I hope and pray that this individual, the, uh, the, the child in this case, is getting the um, um, needed um, um, therapy or whatever it may be that, uh, that is needed to uh, hopefully um, move forward and, and yeah no I, I you know we holistically have need to fix this all of us this is a societal problem this is a, this is an us problem and we need to fix this uh, and um, we need to, to definitely fix it because you guys are the regulators 
and you need to, to tell us what needs to be done and if there's a, there are uh, situations, there are laws that need to be tweaked and changed because we need, you know, there needs to be higher standards. And I'm sure you, you are imposing higher standards, but maybe we need to even impose higher, higher standards than what we're imposed, that we're doing right now um, because, you know, uh, one, is, one is one too many um, for that to happen, and we hope and pray that it doesn't happen again. So I, I'm looking forward uh, to uh, uh, look at, um, and I wish the AG was here and, and your director as well, and how we could, I hope this won't be the end of this, uh, this um, uh, oversight that we work with the, the folks in the, um, in the legal community as well and what else we can do to, uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen, happen again and, um, and whatever it is that we need to do to strengthen the work that you guys do to be able to, uh, again, um, um, have a perfect record without, uh, you know, um, any... Uh, falling through cracks uh, situation, but uh, um, th that's it, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate uh, ladies being here this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Lujan. Senator Taitui, one follow-up question? Yeah, just w one real quick one, only because you mentioned those who are inspecting uh, the house on quarterly basis. Um, is the guardian of Leidemann, is it, they're also involved too? Because you only mentioned three, the social worker, the um, mother, uh, house mom, or, and then yourself, <laughs> but. Yes, Senator Tello. Um, the guardian litem who represents the children in court also go out to the home as frequent okay. as, it, depending on each of the lawyer's preference, right? Or okay. it's either the lawyer or their assigned advocate from their office. And they do inspections as well? Yes, they do go out to the homes where the children okay. are at. Okay, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Senator Brown, you had a follow-up. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just have a couple of questions. In the presentation you relayed, and I know the speaker brought this up, about the law enforcement records management system. Have you been able to use that prior, or is this something, because you have it under future plans to expand background checks. Was this available to you previously, or is it just now being implemented? It is not available to us yet. We are asking access to that um, record system. Okay. and. Um, what, what is the feedback from the court? Are they open to allowing you access or? As per my discussion with Ms. Rossetti, she was going to discuss it with her team um, and I will do a follow up with her um, to see okay. what can one, we one other question I also had, I mean, do these children, and understand, I mean, these children sometimes for maybe their own home situation are already going through challenges. You know, they're not, what we would always expect sometimes as a result of their circumstances, they're, you don't always understand if what they're saying is what's going on because of their, what they've experienced. Do, are these children ever provided when they go into a foster home a safe word or something that if there's something not in order or something harmful to them, are they like given a safe word to say, hey, if I say this word, this means there's something that's not right so that a social worker can respond to that. Because I can't imagine, I, I got to go home every day to a home. I've always had a home. But not every child's had a home. And if they're in a situation, you know, where they're being threatened, where they're being told, hey, if you say anything, I'm gonna kill your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, whatever, I'm gonna kill you. I mean, what, how can they express if they are in a situation of duress to a social worker that something's not right. Because if, 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 if there's indeed the case, and like I said, I will follow this case, and I am going to request we come back uh, with your director and the Attorney General, and we're gonna look at this particular case. But if we did indeed have a situation of having a social worker telling a child, or telling a parent to tell their child to behave because they're acting up with a foster parent, and the foster parent you know, the child is saying you're not respecting, you know, you need to respect the foster parent, and the child is saying, but this foster parent is not respecting me. And this child is being abused. Because we'll, we'll find out, I guess, in the, in the course of this investigation, how it came to light that this child was being abused. And I don't know if this child directly told the 
you know, their, their, um, their caseworker that this happened or how this came to be? We'll find out. But what recourse do children have? Who, what can they say in this interaction? Or are they even given a safe word to relay if something's wrong? Because they may not be able to say it directly. Because I don't know if the foster parent's present. I don't know if a social worker meets the child separately. We don't know if this child's being threatened. You know, psychological control can be more a jail cell than physical jail cell. If you're, if you're, you're made to be fearful, you know, what recourse do you have? Right. I so mean, is, what, what practice is it for a child to say, help, help me? Unfortunately, I can't confirm that. And any or all of the social workers have done that, but it's a great suggestion that um, I, I will t talk to all my social workers about. Um, thank you for that. But I, I can't confirm if any of them practice that already, but it's a great suggestion. Well, I, I hope we would because, again, I mean, a child's got to feel empowered in some way and that if there's someone they can reach out to, if there's just a safe word that they can say that triggers something to say, hey, wait a minute, this needs further review. Um, because, you know, these children already are in an unfortunate circumstance and we don't want them to be further harmed because they are going to, as you've seen, you know, they end up becoming the offenders out there when they're abused like this. Not in all cases, but in some cases, they end up going out and they become the predators because this is the life that they've lived of abuse. And some of these children, when you hear their situation, their stories are just horrendous. You don't know how they live through it, especially even abuse within their own homes, among their own siblings that have happened in this community. It's, it's very, very disturbing. But I think we agree as a community, this is not acceptable behavior. And we have to make sure that we're putting our children in safe hands, even if it's for a temporary family, we have to make sure that they're in safe hands. With that, Madam Speaker, and thank you for coming and providing your, your testimony. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to ask these follow-up questions. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Brown. Um, to public health, I want to thank you again. Um, I do not believe any of this is sugarcoating. I know that uh, this was a tragic and shocking to everybody, including you, who work in this field every single day, who are our front lines, to really prevent further abuse, to take care of children who may have been abused, and, and to find and scramble to find other solutions. I think there, of course, was a failure. There was a failure when we lost the NCIC clearances in 2021, October 2021, that we didn't replace that with something else that would show what we now have gaps in, right? Or we, we had gaps in, that was, um, so there are three steps in the criminal process, right? Arrests, they get arrested, that's by the police or some other uh, law enforcement. Second, they, they have to be charged by the AG. And anywhere along there, the AG could decide not to charge those people and, and there would be no record of any, you know, AG action or court action. Uh, there's also, uh, between the charge, of course, and a conviction, anything can happen. They can drop the case, they expunged records, apparently, all of it. So what we were looking at, or what public health was looking at, after losing the NCIC clearance was only convictions, right? And those are what was accessible. So I am very, um, actually, um, I think public health did immediately what, what it needed to do and consulted with the Attorney General. And I want to commend the Attorney General, although I invited him to be here and the police chief to be here. I also am a little disappointed that they're not here, but I am very happy that the Attorney General responded to you immediately and offered clearances from his office. That would at least take care of the, that stage between an arrest and a conviction of any active cases or previous cases, I think it would also show you, right? So charges that have been made against any person, any individual. Uh, I know that you immediately worked with the courts as well, and I'm, pen I'm pending their response. Please let me know. But uh, I also want to commend DYA for being very responsive, and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. I think your earlier collaboration with DYA has really um, forged a strong bond, and they knew right away what to do, and that was to, to provide you clearances as well. 
uh, because they are law enforcement, they have additional clearances. So I want to thank you for making it very clear in your presentation what you had before, what you have now, and that you, are, you have already added on, and what you intend to add on. And so for the public listening, just want to repeat what you're adding on to the previous police clearances and superior court clearances that only showed you know, certain evidence or certain uh, information, you now have, and you also had access before to the Navy Criminal Investigation Services or NCIS um, for active duty and dependents. And that would show you, is that just convictions or arrests also for military dependents and active members? It won't show whether there was anything against Okay, great. Record, that's so they do, you do take um, military families as foster families. You're currently continuing to do that. You have available uh, the NCIS to, to review their backgrounds. All right. So what you've added on now, according to your testimony today, is you have added on a general internet search. Of course, that sounds obvious to us now, but that was not in the procedures for CPS because, you know, that these were established a while ago. But uh, thank you for responding quickly and in including that now. Um, that you've added on a virtual computerized criminal history which reflects arrest. This is the VCCH. This is what you got from DYA. You've added on an attorney general clearance from the General Crimes Division. You're, uh, you've added on a, a review of the Child Abuse and Neglect Registry, which is a BOSA in-house re registry. And you are intending to add on um, a special police clearance from GPD for CPS in particular that would show charges and criminal history, what all the law enforcement have access to. You are working with GPD to add on communications with the Criminal Investigation Division and the Domestic Abuse Response Team, or the DART team, on active cases. So you will then know arrests and active cases if do, these two things come through with GPD. And uh, access to the LERMS, Law Enforcement Records Management System. Again, access to arrests and uh, other records through GPD. Can you give us a time frame of when you expect GPD to give you a firm response? I know that we are, um, a memo was sent to Chief Ignacio, but we have not heard back, so we'll continue to follow up and see. I, I don't exactly have a time frame, ma'am. All right, I'm going to put a time frame on myself, 10 days, and, and I'm going to follow up within that time, and if not, then we'll see what we can do. And I, I want to thank the senators for pointing out that, yes, if there's something we can do on our side, and you also pointed this out, we will do that to allow access. And then Superior Court of Guam, uh, you've also made, have discussions with them, and I'm going to do the same. I'd like to hear back from them within 10 days. It's April 14th, uh, where you discussed obtaining court clearances with active cases, not just convictions, right? I actually thought court clearances already obtain, you know, active cases. Again, the one incident that we're talking about was not an active case. That was the that was the issue there, right? It was a, it was previous cases that might have brought. None of these that you're. And then of course the NCIC fingerprint background check. Hopefully that's going to show you arrest as well and any other, any other information that law enforcement is currently entitled to. So. None of these is going to show you anything about a person where a complaint has not been made against them or they've never been arrested. And I think that's, that's probably the bulk of the um, criminal sexual conduct that we are seeing in our court system is actually those who had never had a previous record. I mean, we are unfortunately seeing repeat offenders, but um, I am very concerned about those who we can't tell from any of these records despite access as to whether you know, they are perpetrators. So, I think the suggestions from the senators as to expanding who you interview, you know, uh, is a good idea. Expanding the number of visits that you make in any way that you can, of course, is a good idea. And um, I, mean, I want to also make clear that uh, you, your action to stop 
provisional licenses until the full vetting that you're now requiring is done. I think that's a good move. I think that causes a slight delay. How, how much of a delay do you think it would cause, it is going to cause, or it's causing, because you've already implemented this process, and I want to thank you for doing that immediately. Right, so of the three licenses that we have issued since we started this whole new background check, um, it took between 10 to 14 days. Uh -huh. And it really does depend on um, how fast also the foster applicant is obtaining all the required documents. All right, and so I can see that that is a big issue for emergency placement. You can't like emergency um, authorize a foster parent, right? You, you're going to be relying even more on our current foster parents. And uh, this is again, just a, it's a growing concern. So I wanna thank again, the foster parents who are currently serving in this capacity who are assisting you in in these emergency placements, especially under these circumstances where we are requiring additional vetting. Um, and thank you all for your patience in that and, and your service really. Um, so let's see if there's any way that can be done quicker and if there's any way we can help in that vetting act, you know, uh, being faster, uh, let us know if any of these agencies need any type of law change to require faster access to that type of information. Um, yeah, I wanted to make clear that the committee has not been made aware of any allegations of CPS workers coercing children and what they say r during visitation. Uh, so the concerns that Senator Brown has brought up, if, if I would like you to look at those and see if there's any way that you can put some checks and balances on that and, uh, and just report to us what, what you've implemented yourself to, to kind of put your own internal checks and balances as to whether that's happening. I guess, you know, the, the goal is to get children to report as fast as possible, and I know that is a CPS's goal always. Uh, so, um, yeah, please. Uh, I, I haven't received myself any formal allegations, but because that's been raised, if you could just please check your procedures. And I want to know then, um, these significant changes that you've made to your vetting, how, how will... Are these changes to your standard operating procedures? Are these changes are going to be made formally as rules and regs? Or are these, what, how, will the, how will we ensure the continuity of these changes? So Senator, I think um, right now because we are being reactive and there's many background checks right now, um, we wanted to an evaluation over some time to see what are probably duplicate efforts so we can minimize, you know, we want to, I hope there's just one background check that would have everything, but well, we're learning. And um, I think that's where, when we finally decide what are the, the best ones to do that we can update the public law because it, don't, it still shows NCIC on it. Um, so we can redo that um, and work with, you know, the committee on moving forward then and updating even the GAR. Okay, I agree. They do look a little duplicate. Dupli duplicative now mm -hmm. and so yes we'd be happy to change the law and uh, for what you believe is the best practice at that time all right senators thank you again for being here and for your concerns and uh, your very good questions and the acting director if you'd like to make any additional comments yes just an additional uh, in response to uh, senator tello's question about the de director and deputies uh, presence we did have our deputy terry who did try to uh, get on uh, via zoom or uh, but he was uh, informed he was not able to, so he didn't want to join us virtually if, if that was possible. So I do want to put this up because this is still uh, for the record. So uh, not that they're silent, but he did try to make that attempt. So we do just make sure that that's brought up. Thank you. All right. I am not aware of that request myself. Um, I'm looking at my chief of staff. She's not either, but we'll follow up with that. Anyway, Madam Thank Speaker, you. I'm sure yes. that as a result of this, and, and we can come back again for a follow-up on the oversight hearing as more information is provided, I think that would be helpful, where we could actually have the director, the deputy uh, present, and the attorney general. And uh, we also requested of Senator Chris Barnett uh, to have the chief, you know, for the public safety side, the chief of police, 
uh, just so that as we move forward with this process, we can get a collective input it, as we move to address appropriate legislation. Thank you, Senators. Thank you, Acting Director. I want to thank you for being, you're the Acting Director, yeah. right? Yep. For Guam right now? Right now, yep. So you are the Acting Director, and, and for whatever other reasons, the, the Director and the deputies are not available. Uh, I have to say that must be some official, you know, it's official that you are the Acting Director. So I want to thank you very much for being here. I want to thank uh, your team uh, for being very um, quick acting and doing, doing your best under the circumstances. And I, uh, uh, we can always do better, right? So I hope that all of you at CPS do not get discouraged, but you just, we just work harder, do, do better. And uh, I think some of the things that you've outlined are, are going to be successful. And I hope you can get one, one uh, check that's going to be inclusive of all the information that is needed. And again, the information that's not included anywhere, right, that we're just gonna continue as always to look at those. And, and I, I appreciate, um, Ms. Moffness, that you are the acting chief of the Division of Children's Wellness and that also um, you've really you know, stepped up to do this uh, work. So and to all of you, again, you are the ones who are doing this every single day. You are the faces for these children. You are the hope for them and for all the foster families and, and, and really for our entire justice system, right? They're in foster families because of other issues. And uh, those are issues that we as a society need to remedy. That's really the root of all of it. And uh, so I want to thank you again. Uh, we will not conclude this oversight hearing. It is currently 1.50, I'm sorry, it's 12.50 p.m. Thank you.